Hello and welcome to Inside EVs. You join me here in studio with something very special. Yes, this is the Nissan Aria, Nissan's new electric crossover. And in today's video, we're gonna take you through the interior, exterior, and through all of the technical details. You're joining me now for the first time taking a look at the car. We literally got here just about five minutes ago, and I figured I'd give you my first impressions uh, and tell you a little bit about the car. Now, this particular one is in copper two-tone. That's what they're calling this color, uh, and it is almost final production. They say it's about 98% done, but they can't share all of the details of what won't make it to production. Of course, the car still has to go through homologation, etc. but it is very close and very representative of what we'll see on the road. So let's take a look up front. I'll take you on a tour of the exterior car. We'll explore the interior. I still haven't even sat in it, but join me as we go on a tour of the Aria. Uh, first thing you'll notice is LED headlights all around, this kind of cool accenting line. And I really love this lighted Nissan badge. I hope that makes it to production because while I don't like the Mercedes light up badge or anything, this actually is kind of cool. I don't know why it's any different, but I think it looks great, especially as an accent to this large grill area. And there's no intake on this area because there's no need. There's no internal combustion engine. So behind here, you have a radar unit, of course, and we'll talk about some of the driver assistance features on this car and some of the big things that set this apart from the Leaf and really bring us into the next generation. So let's go around the side of the car before we get into those. And you'll notice uh, 19 inch wheels all around, or it might be 20s. Let's take a look. Yep, 20 inch wheels look really nice. Love the design kind of aero focused around the back here on the roof you'll see two shark fin antennas one of them houses all of the am fm sirius uh, communications xm the other one houses its telecommunications and so you know some automakers choose to put them in side view mirrors some don't here nissan opted to put them on the roof i think it gives it a distinctive look and it looks pretty nice the new trend, obviously, in automotive is to go with a long taillight strip across the back. This is no exception, but it is tasteful. It's not big and huge and bright. It just is a nice accenting line. And of course, here you can see these really cool new type font we haven't seen on Nissans before. And in this sort of brushed aluminum finish, I think that looks really nice, especially accented on the copper paint. So we need to talk about the big elephant in the room, which is the Nissan Leaf. This was Nissan's real first foray into electric cars. They really had the first mass market EV sold here in the US. You know, Nissan has done a lot for electric transportation. We cannot ignore that. So there's always that one fatal flaw that comes up with the Nissan Leaf though, which is DC fast charging, driving it hard, battery overheats. Nissan says this will not be a problem with the Aria, and the reason is liquid active thermal management. Finally, you can now drive this car on the hottest day, charge it as much as you want, and it will not overheat. We're of course going to test this, but I'm so happy that this car is brought into the modern era. Now, speaking about charging, this right here is the charge port. It's on the front passenger side, unlike a lot of vehicles we've seen. I actually can't think of one other EV that is on the front passenger side. Maybe Porsche Taycan is. Leave a comment below if you know of EVs with charge ports here on the front passenger side. And it's a CCS connection. chatamo has gone. So at least for the US market, the JDM cars will still have Chatamo ports on them. But for US market cars, Nissan has officially made the switch to CCS. This means there's no other mass automaker selling cars in the United States for battery electric vehicles with a Chatamo port. Chatamo, is it officially dead? Should we keep it alive? Comment below, of course. Uh, 130 kilowatt peak charging rate here as well, which is very solid. Now, of course, it's not gonna blow you a 270 like a Taycan or 300 kilowatts of a Lucid. This is not meant for that. This is an everyday you know, electric crossover and 130 kilowatts is totally fine. And by the way, it's a little more than Volkswagen's ID4. So that 130 kilowatts is also peak speed is rated for both battery pack sizes. 
Now we don't know on each battery pack the DC charging curve. Of course, we're gonna test it here on Inside EVs, so subscribe to our YouTube channel if you wanna see a lot of our testing. But the 130 kilowatt is available both on the 65 kilowatt hour battery pack and the 90 kilowatt hour battery pack. Now both of those are gross capacities. The 65 kilowatt hour pack will give you 63 kilowatt hour usable. The 90 kilowatt hour pack will give you 87 kilowatt hour usable. So really nice uh, usage of the battery. I hope Nissan allows you to user select your charge limit so you're not putting them up to 100% every day because there's probably a little buffer up top, not as much as you would need to just full charge them all the time. And that's a little bit of a different from what we've seen from other automakers. Volkswagen with the ID4, for example, really has quite a big buffer on there. Same with Audi e-tron, they're conservative. Nissan has a lot of experience with battery electric vehicles, so they're just allowing you to use more of that battery pack capacity. The cells on this car come from CATL. They are prismatic cells, if you're curious. I've already mentioned the battery pack differences, but let's talk about all of the trims available in the Nissan Aria. And there are four major drivetrain configurations that you can option on this car. The entry level model will be the 65 kilowatt hour gross battery pack that is front wheel drive. You can then option E-Force all wheel drive on that small battery pack. I'm glad that Nissan is allowing you to get all wheel drive on the smaller battery pack because so many people don't need the big battery, especially if you live in a metropolitan area. And if that small battery can truly do 130 kilowatt DC charge rate, then for the one or two times a year, you might take a trip. It's all you need. No need to haul around more batteries than what you're gonna be using. Now for folks like me who drive a lot, you will have a extended range version, the long range option, which is gonna be the big battery front wheel drive. And Nissan claims somewhere around that high 200, 300 mile range EPA, but of course it hasn't gone through its testing cycle yet. So we'll be keeping a close eye on the range of that model. And we'll also of course be testing each model with our 70 mile per hour highway, almost patented, but not quite there range test that we do here on Inside EVs. The top of the line model, which you're seeing now, is the Nissan uh, Aria SL E-Force with the big battery, long range. And this is the same exact battery pack, but in all wheel drive configuration. Now, all wheel drive configurations do lose a little bit of cargo capacity. And all that really does is just eat up the underfloor storage of the trunk. So not the end of the world. And I think, um, a lot of options to go for. I know I'm saying comment down below, but I'm really curious as to which version of the Nissan Aria you personally would go for. I could see a big case for the $40,000 starting price of the small battery pack with the front drive unit only, or would you just max it out and go big battery all wheel drive? I think actually maybe the sweet spot might be small battery all wheel drive. That really intrigues me. Let's take a look on the inside. This is the first time. Well, one of the things that's really important is how does the door feel? So obviously it's still a prototype car, but the door handle and chunky closing sound is really nice. I gotta say that feels better than most any other Nissan product I've experienced. There's also a nice little kick plate down here that says E-Force. I guess you get that with the all wheel drive trim. I'm gonna put the headlights in auto so that the dinging stops. The seat material seems to be I guess a natural leather, at least it feels like to me, with a little Alcantara in the middle, perforated material. Seems pretty nice. Yeah, I love that door closing sound. That's really chunky, that's nice. Now, the seat. Instantly, I feel like I'm sitting pretty high up. But again, it's an SUV, you would expect that. Um, I really hope this steering wheel material makes it into production, at least on the higher trims, because this feels really nice and soft, and there's no way this is not natural leather. Although I would like to see some animal free uh, products in here. I'm sure there'll be trims where they can offer more of that. Let's see if I can adjust the steering wheel to be closer, yes. Wow, nice, really open cabin space. Uh, as you guys know, we drive a BMW i3, that's my girlfriend's car. And this is very reminiscent of the i3. And that's what I'm speaking to uh, specifically is this area down here by my feet. There is almost no hump, just a little bit here. And it's totally open. It's really cool. It makes this car feel so spacious. You can just lounge all the way out. Uh, and these carpets are really, really plush carpets. That's nice. Um, 
So in terms of spaciousness, if you're a tall person, plenty of headroom. I'm six foot one. I have about, I would say about six inches of headroom, maybe five inches of headroom above my head. Uh, so, so totally easily accommodating. Windshield comes up pretty far. You're certainly not gonna have a hard time seeing traffic lights up above your head. The ProPilot Assist uh, bubble here uh, does take up quite a bit of space. I would like to have seen this a little bit narrower, but not the end of the world. It doesn't obstruct your vision in any way. And then of course you get this beautiful gauge unit. Now I'm seeing ahead of me a heads up display. We're gonna go through in a minute and just see if what these displays can do, what we can access, what we can't, some of the haptic controls of the buttons here. But um, we should just talk about the, the hard design functions. Now every manufacturer of course needs to have their own silly shifter and no exception here. This thing moves forward and back. You have, I guess, yeah, the release switch on the left side and then park on the roof. It works, you just get in, pull it back and you go. Makes sense, very intuitive, no problems there. You have a little cubby hole, doesn't seem to open yet. It's pre-production, I'm sure this is where the cup holders will go. There is a really neat feature here though that I've not seen on many cars, maybe none at all. There's a switch on my side with a forward and back arrow and I can move the entire center console forwards or back. How neat is that? So if you're a tall person and you sit farther back, you can move this back with you. If you need more space down here, uh, or if you need to increase leg room for the middle seat, you just push this all the way forwards and now the middle passenger has more leg room. There's also air vents in the back here for your rear passengers, which is really nice, especially for Uber and rideshare. You always like to have vents for the rear passengers. That is a really big plus. So um, storage, yes, just a little bit under here. Here is the key, actually. That is a really nice looking key. I wonder if that's just for the prototype or if that's production ready. And this seems to be a charger of some kind. So I think what you can do is grab your phone, just slide it in there, and then it'll wirelessly charge. Although you can't get it out without opening this thing. Hmm, not a, not a big deal. Um, back to driver assistance for a second before we get into what it can and can't do you have a little eye mirror here eye vision sensor i should say so this car uses two different forms of driver monitoring system basically the car's do, doing its job to see if the human's paying attention while it's assisting with driving again not full self-driving but it is assistance this car has a torque sensor in the wheel and eye tracking for movement so in certain scenarios you won't even need to touch the steering wheel on highways pretty neat Going to take a look at the back seat. Of course, we need to make sure the door closes just as nice as the front door. Really pleased with that door opening and closing. Really nice backlighting here on the window controls as well. Nice waiting to them. Again, same thick carpets we see back here. And I love that door sound. That's great. So this is really cool. One of the best back seats instantly right off the bat that I've felt in any EV. Blows away the Model Y rear seats. You guys know I do not like the back seats of the Model Y. They're uncomfortable. It kind of feels like you're sitting on a park bench. I love the airiness of the cabin, but this seems to have that same feeling. You have three levels of heated seats that are user selectable by the back seat. Can't do that in a Tesla. Not that I'm comparing this to a Tesla, but of course uh, that's really nice. And then you have these nice air vents back here I mentioned before. You have USB-C and USB-A. I don't know the power outputs of those ports, but certainly might be promising if we can get a high power USB-C. Two cup holders, of course this will slide up or down, pretty standard. Yeah, feels great back here. Again, I'm six foot one, I can sit back here comfortably. Uh, being a battery electric vehicle, there is no scalloping in the floor for your feet to go down. Some EVs make room for that, this one does not, so your knees are a little bit high up. Um, so uh, certainly my thighs are not actually touching this part of the seat here. For shorter passengers, this won't be a problem and it's not a problem in the front seat. It's just the back is a little bit high up here, but I think it's a good compromise. I'd rather have the battery. And while I'd love to show you the trunk of the vehicle, they do have some power electronics back there that are specific to this model, not representative of a final production. So I can't show you the trunk. I also can't show you the charge port. They offered to do it, but they'd have to unplug the entire vehicle from its uh, location where it's plugged in the ground 
totally fine there. And one thing that you should note uh, or take note of is there is no front trunk in the Aria. A lot of EVs make room for the front trunk. But what Nissan did, I think, is actually sort of smart. They, what they did was instead of adding extra cargo space in the front, they took a lot of their power electronics, HVAC controls, and put them in the front of the vehicle so that you have more cabin space. And that seems to be like a pretty good compromise to me. You know, I own many EVs with front trunks and I very rarely use them. Some people, of course, will disagree with me, but personally to me, I would say that's a nice to have, but not a need to have, and it doesn't really bother me at all. All right, let's go through the interface on the Nissan Aria, some of the screens. First off, uh, the first thing you'll notice, and I'm going to close them here in a second, you have two glove boxes. Because you have this expansive space, you have big storage here, and you have another one right there. Free production car. Uh, not everything's screwed together, but it actually feels really almost ready. You have your start button here. All of these are non-physical buttons, so they're all haptic controls. So you're driving, let's say you want to turn on the climate. You just push in a little bit, boom, you just push in each one. It's really good tactile feedback actually. And uh, it just shows right through here. Now I'm going to turn off the climate so we don't run the AC compressor. It was just kicking up there. And then you also have separate haptic controls here. If you can see here's where you can adjust your drive mode from standard to sport down to eco mode or snow. Uh, kind of cool. It says we've hit the bottom there. And this is a different haptic feedback than this panel right here. Although I would say this has really nice audio feedback as well. I really like this. You can also toggle your e-pedal on and off, which is regenerative braking, but also blending physical discs, disc brakes towards the end to bring you to a complete stop. I really like e-pedal. And then you also have your automatic parking functionality down here. Now your two screens here are gorgeous and the heads up display is functioning as well. You won't be able to see it from your position, but I can see you know, everything from audio to navigation to our current speed in there. And here you have your two displays. Now this is currently non-functional pre-production car. Um, uh, yeah, again, it doesn't do anything, but it will beautiful display. Uh, I would say tons of functionality, everything you would expect to have in your normal car. It also has wireless Apple CarPlay and wireless Android Auto. So you don't even have to plug your phone in to get Apple CarPlay on here. I'm a big fan of that. So let's see if I can figure out how to work all this stuff. So here we have our power percentage and our range again, 300 miles on the longest rain option, range option. And Nissan, at least in the Leaf, has calculated this off of your driving history. I'm not sure if this car will be a guessometer, something that's predictive range calculation based off of your driving patterns, or if it will be a rated range calculation at a set consumption rate like Tesla does. We'll have to see. My guess is it will be adjustable based off your driving. Um, let's see how I go through some more menus. Here we go. We have our driving computer. You can see your average consumption, driving time, pretty standard stuff there. We have your average uh, consumption and your history. Beautiful displays, by the way. And then here you have your safety systems. We'll talk about that at the end because there's quite a bit to get into, but this is where you activate everything there. Here's all your warnings, just saying the doors are open on the car. And then of course your settings menu, you can go through and adjust everything you want to do. But let's see, things are not in English. <laughs> Pretty funny, but hey, look, that's great. I think these are these are great. Um, you also on this side of the steering wheel have your Pro Pilot button. So this is where you're able to turn on and off your adaptive cruise control and lane keeping. Now the Aria comes with safety sense as standard. So all of your safety components will be on every Aria, even including the $40,000 base version. And that's before tax credits, keep in mind. This is priced really well. So you have ultrasonic sensors all around the car that monitor close range interactions. You have a long range radar off, radar off the front. You have three cameras off the windshield and one off the back. And all of these can work together to determine the area around the vehicle. You will have automatic emergency braking that is logical. So it'll come up to a car. If it really thinks you're gonna hit them, it will warn you and then slam on the brakes. It will also do this for pedestrians. Uh, it has lane centering, or I should say uh, lane departure warning. So if you're about to go out of a lane, it will push you back in and warn you. And it will also even stop you from crashing into things. Now we've tested this on the Nissan Leaf. If you're backing into something and you just back up, back up, back up, it slams on the brakes and it doesn't let you crash. 
Uh, pretty cool technology, something my personal Tesla Model 3 doesn't even do, but it will not let you hit things at low speed. Kind of cool. Now, there is an option that is standard on the SL, like this one here, and on the SV, it's optional. It's called Pro Pilot Assist. Now, the Nissan Leaf has this, other Nissan products has this, but this is 2.0. This is the next generation. It uses eye tracking as another form of DMS, driver monitoring system. So on you know single or multi-lane highways, if you're in lane, it will allow you to actually take your hands off the wheel as long as you're watching the road. Interesting, I still have not tried one of these systems. I'm very much looking forward to it. Um, ProPilot says 2.0 should be pretty good. Now, it will also take into account your navigation data and with a little bit of torque on the steering wheel, it will make automatic lane changes for you, either into the faster lane to pass vehicles and merge back in, and it will also take exits. So it will, if it sees you're getting off in the next mile, start to merge the car over to the right, and then it will pull you off the exit and then resume control back to the human behind the wheel. Pretty cool technology, I'm looking forward to it and uh, can't wait to get one of these into our tests for our 70 mile per hour highway range test and of course our DC fast charging tests. Subscribe to Inside EVs for more. We have a lot of cool EVs that we're checking out over the next few years, so follow us along for the ride and thanks for watching. We'll see you on the next one.